Hi everyone, my name is Renee Richard. I'm the founder and executive director of Cinnamon Girl Incorporated. I'm excited to introduce my organization to you as we begin this amazing book talk. Cinnamon Girl is an organization of leaders providing girls of color with experiences and a network of influential people that help build confidence, develop her talents, and reveal her true potential to radically change the world. We are in our 17th year of teaching girls leadership development. We inspire girls to set and achieve rigorous goals, provide guidance and support as to what's needed to prepare her for college and graduate school, and expose girls to a global mindset through international travel. And finally, we have a phenomenal writing program that introduces girls to the world of literature. Our cinnamon girls are surrounded with other ambitious youth, hands-on mentors, high-performing female leaders that encourage her to step out of her comfort zone, knowing she has the tools to take charge of her life and become a successful leader. We are together inspiring girls destined for greatness. So for more information, visit cinnamongirl.org. And with that, I introduce to you one of our fierce leaders. Uh, thank you, Renee. Uh, my name, I'm, I'm also Renee, I'm the other Renee. Uh, I am a sophomore in the Bay Area. I'm a part of Cinnamon Girl. This is my first year being part of the organization and I'm liking it, I'm loving it so far. Uh, and I'm also a writer, so this is going to be interesting for me because a lot of my questions that I'm going to have today are so focused around writing and more on like how they actually were able to create their books. So uh, let me introduce, let's, let's have the authors introduce themselves. Let's start with Ernesto. Uh, my name is Ernesto Cisneros. I'm the author of Efren Divided, a middle grade book about a 12-year-old boy whose li life is turned upside down when his mom is deported leaving him to fend for himself and for his little brother and sister in hopes that she will soon return. And Kate? Uh, hi, I'm Kate O'Shaughnessy. My, I think my book will probably be backwards, yeah, but I'm the, um, the author of The Lonely Heart of Maybell Lane, which is my middle grade debut about a girl who goes on a long journey to meet her father when she learns that he'll be judging a singing competition uh, for which she signs up as a contestant. So it's a road trip story. Yeah, so I've actually read parts of both of these books, and I love both of them so far. I'm like halfway through both of them. But obviously, one thing that I noticed, since I'm 15 years old, I'm not a middle grade, it's not really my demographic. But even with even despite not being the, the, the age demographic that I was meant to be, I still saw that you were both able to very like eloquently talk about children and write in the perspective of a child. Can you talk about how you're able to do that even as adults and how you were able to write from the perspective of a kid? Sure, yeah, I, I, I'm happy to, to go first. Um, I, a question that I feel like I ask a lot of friends when they ask me this question, I, I ask them like, how old do you feel in your heart? And sometimes people will immediately respond. Like one of my best friends said, she's like 17. I think I will always be 17. She just felt an affinity for that age. And for me, I've always felt that about being 12. Like, I feel like something in my heart will remain 12. I don't know if there's just something about that age that really stuck with me. Uh, but accessing that for me is much easier than, it, than when I've tried to write YA, for instance. So writing, accessing the teenager years are a little bit harder for me. Whereas thinking about how, the emotions that I went through at that age and what I was going through, and you're in this really unique spot when you're 12 or 11, when you're kind of a kid but you're understanding that the world is this big place and and is a little bit scarier than you may have thought and you're trying to figure out how to deal with that and so I think that my own access to that age I think has really helped me remember what it was like you know because I don't think I've ever truly left it behind yeah um, for me I think it's because I'm a middle grade teacher and so for the last 20 years I spent all day in a room with 38 kids all, I mean, from 8 a.m. to 2.30. Uh, so that's who I interact with. That's probably where I get my sense of humor and everything's kind of gauged for that age. Um, 
so I think that really helps. Uh, the other thing that helped me helps me to write is to just really channel the characters. I call it method writing. So I just really close my eyes and just try and become the characters when I write them. Um, and then just try and just remember all the good memories that I had and all my friends and the things we used to do. And, uh, and just ask myself, well, what would I do if I were in this situation and at this age and how would I react back then? Yeah, definitely. It's, it's, it's like writing your, reading your book. I definitely relate to the characters because I was thinking, how does, how is he able to write dialogue that is so accurate? Cause I could really see kids in, mm -hmm. in 2020 saying things like this, even as a 15 year old, I don't think I'd be able to write from the perspective of a child younger than me. I it, just not really my thing anymore, but yeah, I was very impressed in how you're able, both able to write from the perspective of kids. So that was my biggest question. But um, basically, uh, my next question is, how did you get the ideas for it? Like, where did it all begin? What was the, con what, what conceived your novel? How did you all decide that you wanted to start writing and what got the ball rolling? Um, okay. Um, well, for, for me, it, it wasn't so much of a choice. Um, I mostly uh, had been writing YA exclusively, and um, and then it was at times during the elections, and there was a lot of stuff being said about Latinos, and um, I just felt obligated to kind of address everything that was being said. And I had some students that were losing parents, or their parents were being deported in the mid, uh, middle of the year, and I was seeing the effects of it. And I just really thought that the kids needed a voice, somebody to to speak up for them. Um, so it wasn't like I really chose a topic. It was almost like the topic just kind of found me. Um, and I wanted people, there was so much hate and hateful things being said about Latinos. I wanted to take control of the narrative. I wanted to um, show people what a real Latino family is like not, and not all the stereotypes, um, all the things that society, you know, we see on TV and everything. Uh, I, just had, I just figured, you know what, let me write about my family, which is kind of what Efren is. This is actually just a, I call it like a door book because I just kind of opened the front door and invited you guys all into my, to meet my family, my crazy family. And, um, and I just wanted, you know, everybody in America, it's a lot easier to hate people you don't know very well. And if they want to hate, they can hate, but they're going to meet me first and then they're going to be my family. And if they, you know, hopefully I'll change a few minds. Yeah. I actually have a question specifically for your book. Um, how was it difficult kind of writing about a sort of controversial topic, especially like now talking about Trump, talking about politics, was it difficult including politics into a story about children? Like, did you think, okay, maybe this isn't a good idea? Did you have any second thoughts about that? I didn't want to address the, the negative. And I believe there's only one comment in the book. And I'll let you, I'm, I'm pretty sure you'll find it, uh, that actually I couldn't hold back. And uh, it was kind of comical. And uh, that's the only one that kind of slipped in there. I just didn't want to address those things. So I, I tried to just stay really positive and not be influenced and let the story stay loyal to the story and not to the politics, I guess. Yeah. But it yeah, wasn't easy. There are so many things I would write and then delete and write and then delete. It's like, nope, nope. Yeah. 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 I, th I feel like a lot of people would have uh, be a little more reserved, like feel like maybe I shouldn't be talking about politics. But I think it is important to have younger people talking about, you know, and learning about politics because it's, they're going to grow up and they're going to be in charge one day. So my next question is, well, is there any importance to the subjects that you both talk about? I know in Kate's book, there's the subject of like uh, the, the main character. She's obviously not having the best life either. And, you know, both characters and both stories are, go through a lot of struggle. Is it important to showcase that and direct it towards young kids? Do you, or should we keep kids, you know, sheltered away from that? What are your thoughts on those? Um, I don't think that we should shelter kids. I think that, I think that kids can handle so much more than adults tend to give them credit for. And I feel like the act of trying to shelter isn't actually doing anything, right? Because you're, they're still going to get that information. They're still going to imbibe things from the world that are painful and true and hard, but they're just not going to get it with a sort of loving kind message that I think that children's literature can really, can really do. Um, there was a great conversation uh, I think published between Matt de la Pena and Katie Camillo about why sad books are so important. Um, I wouldn't categorize my book as a sad book, but I think that the main character goes through a lot of things in the book that are, that are difficult. You know, I think that she's got a single working mom who isn't able to be around that much. They don't have, you know, a great support system for them. 
she has my main character Maybell has mental health struggles that I are that are based off of you know she has panic attacks and that that's something that you know one of the the inspirations I guess you could say for that is that my own you know experience with them and struggle with them and when you're young and you don't know what's happening you can feel so alone and so for me I think writing about those tough things in a way that I hope is filled with love can really I hope because it did for me when I was younger reading books that made me feel less alone help readers feel less alone with those tough topics yeah that's very true uh, and I remember reading Kate DiCamillo books when I was in probably fifth grade or sixth grade and it really like kind of kind of you know wakes you up even though you're so young you you are able to uh, take in information and you are able to consciously be aware of things like that and I agree kids shouldn't be sheltered from these things they deserve to learn as much as adults do, if not even more. Um, so, uh, speaking of, you know, Kate DiCamillo and other authors, what are there any other authors that both of you take inspiration from, some favorite authors that kind of help you write your book and help you form the, your thoughts? Oh, my gosh. That's so hard. <laughs> that, that is really <laughs> tough because, there's so, yeah, there's so many fantastic books out there. Um, quite honestly, I think I kind of rotate my books because I, I try and read something that's not, not necessarily similar as far as story, but as far as uh, maybe the voice or the age group or um, maybe just the tone. And so if I'm reading something, if I want to write something dark, I might read something dark. If I'm trying to read something comic, a funny, a funny scene, I might read something that's a little bit more comical to kind of inspire me or set to get me in that, in that mood. Um, so I, I think I just find books that really inspire me, and there, there's so many of them. Um, it's kind of like what I do with my music. You know, if, if, if I have a dramatic scene, I'm going to be listening to dramatic music while I'm writing. So I do that with my books, too. How, how about you, Kate? Yeah, I, there are so many authors that I feel like I draw inspiration from. Um, I do something similar to you, Ernesto, which is I try to read kind of with the vibe with what I'm trying to achieve. I try not to read too closely because I find that sometimes even by accident, stylistic choices can sort of creep into your writing. If let's say you're writing a middle grade contemporary with X and Y themes, and then you're reading those as well, you, there's some, there's an echo I find. So I try to read things that are a little bit more broad, but in the same vibe. So instead of reading contemporary middle grade, let's say it's about family, I might be reading a lot more contemporary adult, or I'll be reading poetry with themes of family. And I find that that for me really helps me get in the mindset without w w well maintaining my voice and style. I, I can relate to that very, very deeply because the book that I'm writing right now, I'm writing a fantasy and it's like a urban fantasy, really. It's taking place in modern day. And some of the books that I have on my shelf over here are, of course, urban fantasy YA is like the big genre right now for writing. And I'm reading a whole bunch of books that are in that same genre. And I do feel like sometimes, am I taking inspiration or am I just like straight up copying them? And I don't want to feel like that. So I, that's a good tip, you know, trying to, you know, diversify a little bit more. Mm -hmm. But uh, speaking of like books and, you know, writing about like, like people that are uh, in other stories and taking inspiration, in your in your novels in the characters they feel so real sometimes uh, I think like maybe the authors are kind of channeling people in their own lives or maybe even themselves so in your books do you feel like your characters are just completely original or do you take traits from people that you know in real life uh, yeah I, I actually don't draw any inspiration from people in real life because I find that I cannot divorce traits of people in my life, even if they're strangers, from them, their personhood. So for me, it's more, I think I give a lot of myself to the character, like, like tiny little slivers of truth of myself into each character there, you know, and I hope that they come across as very different, but by sort of like, you know, let's say it's that tiny little ember or flame of, you know, this 1.0001% truth of myself, and then I turn it into its own, their own thing and their own character. But by somehow knowing that truth in myself, it allows me to breathe a lot of life into them beyond, you know? So none of my characters are me, you know, at all whatsoever, but there's things that I relate to them deeply about. Um, and I find that that really helps. And obviously like you can draw inspiration of knowing somebody who's, you know, very grouchy all the time or something and know, for me, it's less like I'm going to take their specifics and be like, oh, well, like, 
what are some physical reactions that I've noticed or things like that. But I don't really like ever pull anything from, from real relationships or real people other than myself. What, what about you, Ernesto? Um, I think I'm always kind of looking for quirks uh, from people and I'm very, always on the lookout for them. So I'm always people watching. Um, yeah, so I could be in the classroom and I could just hear something or, you know, the whole chetos in the, in the book. That was from, I heard a student, uh, like, shout that out. And I was like, oh, I, I like the way that sounds. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to maybe put that in the book. I'll put it in the back of my mind and maybe it'll, it'll uh, work its way in there. I do borrow from people. But then they kind of, it's almost like I take seeds. Uh, for example, Ephraim was kind of based on, on my son. My son is the kind of person when we go out to um, to the mall, for example, and he sees that somebody's walking behind him, he'll hold the door. And then if there's somebody else who's relatively close to them, he'll keep holding the door. And many times he gets stuck there and he's just opening the door for everybody. And it's just something that he does. And people, will, uh, when he was smaller, like strangers would come up to us and they would be like, you know, your son is amazing. Can we buy him a pie? And out of no strangers, and just because they, he has, he's so kind, and he, but he also doesn't, he doesn't see that as being like something uh, really valuable. So I think that's what I wanted to channel um, uh, in my character. But once you have my character, it's not really my son because he does other things. And once you have the character, he does whatever the character is going to do, and you kind of, as an, at least for me, I lose control. Um, sometimes I want them to do something, and they don't even listen to me. Uh, and they do their own thing. And, and you know what? That's fine. Uh, that's usually a good thing. I can definitely feel that. I definitely, well, actually, I kind of relate to both of you. I take inspiration from people that I know in my real life, especially like one of the main characters in the story that I'm writing right now is based off of my brother. And yeah, my brother is very different from this character. A lot of the personality traits of that character are actually personality traits that I have. So I kind of combine the two worlds. And I feel like, I don't know, I just want to see if other authors do the same thing, you know? And it's interesting that, we all do different things in our writing with our characters. Uh, so with, with, uh, with, uh, sorry, the, uh, my next question is kind of, my next set of questions are kind of more general, just about writing in general, about being an author, anything that can be applicable to any author. And my first question is, is reading a prerequisite to writing is reading. Do you think that, you have to read books in order to become a writer because as, as, as someone who started off reading, uh, if I hadn't started reading, I wouldn't have started writing. Do you agree with that sentiment? I think all good authors are, are big readers. I, I, I personally do think it's a prerequisite. I think that reading for me is the most, you know, when people ask like, well, how do you learn to write? And I think it's my answer is often by reading a lot and really widely, right? Like that's, it's a love of it. Right. And, I, do, I don't know. I would never be drawn to write a book if I didn't love books as a reader first. Um, and for me, I, I, I struggled to, like, I was a slow reader when I was younger and I had to take developmental classes and I took like two years of classes to help me learn to read. And I think that's when it started the love for me and, and the writing came much, much later. But I, I, I can't imagine being a writer with also, without also being like really identifying as a reader. In fact, I almost feel like I identify as a reader first and author second, but that's, that's me. What, what about you? Um, that's a really <laughs> tough question because um, and I'm, I don't even want to admit this publicly, but I, I'm, I'm going to. Um, I don't, I didn't read from fifth grade until my junior year in high school because I was really turned off to, uh, to books. Uh, when I was in elementary, they would only take the, the honor kids to go to the library, and my teachers never did. Mm -hmm. And I loved to read. When I was in, you know, in elementary, I read everything I could. And then they just, for whatever reason, they just figured you know, kids like me didn't want to read. And so they stopped taking me, and then I just lost interest. Um, but I was always a daydreamer, so I was always creating stories. I just wasn't writing them down. And then when I got older, that's when I uh, reconnected, and then I had a lot of reading to do. Uh, yeah. Even to this day, I'm still trying to read as much. I'm trying to catch up to everybody else. See, but look, uh, you're, you're reading, and I've heard that, though, Ernest. Like, I've heard a lot of, of fall off at that age, and, and I don't think that means that you're not a reader, though. You know, like, I think clearly right now you're talking about all the things you read when you're a writer. Like, can you, can you imagine writing now without also reading at the same time, like books at the same time? 
No. And honestly, the writing to me, you didn't ask this question, but um, when I get writer's block, I don't believe in writer's block anymore because I can just pick up a book. And as soon as I'm reading, I have to put the book down because I just have all these other ideas that I just been triggered. And then I want to sit down and write. But I, I'm, but I am a horrible reader in the sense that I, I take it apart. I analyze if I'm enjoying myself in the pages. I, I call time out and I try to figure out why am I enjoying this? If I'm feeling sad, I want to, I want to figure out why am I feeling sad? So I'm always deconstructing the books and trying to learn from how people are, um, are doing things. So that's why it takes me forever to get through books. Um, same. Sorry, I think I went off topic. I'm not sure. fine, <laughs> I was going to ask uh, about writer's block. Do you guys believe in it? Because I've heard some of my teachers are like, writer's block does not exist. But of course, as a writer, I've been trying to write my story for a good three years now. Uh, obviously, there have been times where I just could not put anything down on the page. Do you believe in writer's block? And if you do, is reading the solution to it? I, I believe that your creative well can get drained and it can be really hard to um, be really actively creative and actively creative in, in sort of the way that drafting a new story requires you to be. I don't know if I would necessarily call that writer's block necessarily, but I do think that we, you know, to, to put too many demands on ourselves creatively, creatively, <laughs> creatively, I can't say that word right now. <laughs> you know what I'm trying to say. Yeah. can drain the well and it can be really difficult to to sort of to get anything out um for me in terms of like that specific writer's block of when you're feeling creative but you can't get it on the page i suffered my husband and i joked we called it my five thousand word curse where i couldn't write a story past five thousand words before everything would fall apart and i couldn't write any more of a story or a book and so i did this again and again and again when i first started writing and finally, I said to myself, you know, I was just like, I have to finish something. I have, and I think it, part of it was perfectionism. And I think that's at the core of a lot of writer's block too. Mm. And so finally, I calendared a certain word count every day. And it wasn't big. It was, it was pretty small. And I wouldn't let myself stand up from the desk until I had finished that. And it didn't matter if it was terrible, because a lot of it was <laughs> really, really bad. But it, was, but it was done, right? And some days were easy and some days were like, squeezing blood from a stone. But I did it every day until I finished that book. And I think and that book will never see the light of day. It's not very good, but it's finished. And I think that for me, finishing something is the cure to writer's block. So I can, that's very true. Mm -hmm. So um, for me, um, I've gone through a couple of uh, stages and I've kind of uh, evolved my philosophy on writer's block. A long time ago, I asked a, an author friend, like, what's the secret to getting published? And she told me it's just how badly do you want it? And so I was a big, I'm a big Laker fan. And so the whole Mamba mentality thing, I, I, just, I, I subscribed to it. And so when I would wake up in the morning, I would ask myself, kind of imagine Kobe, uh, you know, next to me. And I'm like, all right, what would Kobe do right now? And I'm like, well, Kobe would be up in four in the morning doing what he needs to do to get things done. And so I would just tell myself, all right, you know what? Go ahead, admit that you would rather get some sleep instead of uh, getting published. And I would always be like, no, I will not say that. And so I would get myself up. And then when I want to go to bed at night, I would tell myself the same thing. Would you rather go to bed or would you rather be published? And so I would keep, keep doing that. But then I, I also got really sick and I wasn't taking care of myself. And I learned that that was actually probably the worst thing I could be doing. Um, Ephraim divided, I didn't write it that way. And instead, I, I learned to, to be forgiving uh, of myself. So what I learned is that like right now, I'm actually writing right now as we speak. And the way that I'm writing is that I am filling my well again by speaking to you two. Uh, by speaking with students, I'm refilling the well. Meeting with Kate, I'm redoing that too. Later on, if I go over there and I start playing basketball in my driveway, I'm writing during that time too. Because you need that downtime. And without the downtime, it's like working out. You can work out. Anybody who knows anything about working out will tell you, you cannot do it every single day. The body needs to rest. And that's part of, you know, of the, 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 the routine. So, yeah, you got to forgive yourself. And if you need to go to the mall, or, well, not right now, but if you need to, uh, you know, if you need to go out and just live, you can't, what are you going to write about if you don't live? Mm -hmm. So yeah. that, all that stuff you're doing, chatting with people on the phone and being around your friends, guess what? You're writing. 
Yeah, yeah. For me, uh, I've been I've probably struggled with writer's block a lot, and I I think my biggest issue was probably, you know, I was a little too not structured. Like I would just write whenever I wanted to write. And I realized sometimes I do need structure. Some, sometimes I need an outline. I needed to know what I'm going to write before I start writing it. And for this time, I'm finally trying to finish my first draft and I've, you know, set deadlines. I'm going to try to finish it by the end of the month. I'm going to write every single day. And for me personally, having organization is what keeps me on track, but other people need to, you know, actually have a little more little less organization but I guess for every writer it's different so that's why writer's block is kind of a tough subject because you can't really take advice from everyone else you kind of just have to figure it out for yourself and I've been figuring it out for a while so it was nice to get some other perspectives uh, my next question is what is your biggest oh, piece of advice Ernesto, you got muted oh muted sorry what did I you say I was just going to say that, that your answer was the great uh, great answer to uh, to answering what writer's block is Okay. Thank you. Yeah. That's why it's took me a long time to figure that out. I, yeah. and I, and I think we all struggle cause it's like, we all are trying to make something that fits the image in our head. And when it first comes out on paper, it doesn't look that way. Right. So it's like, for me, I feel like writer's blog is also reckoning with that. But like you said, everybody has a different sort of feeling for what it means for them. So yeah, that's a great definition. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, so my next question was kind of, uh, since you know, since you've kind of been through the trials and tribulations of writing, what is your biggest piece of advice to people my age, people maybe even older who are writing their first book like you guys were? And what, what would you have wanted to know that you know now since writing? Hmm. Still okay, sure. Um, well, I've been, I've been at this for 14 years. Uh, well, two years if you if you count the revising of the uh, the books, sixteen total. Um, and what I learned was that, like I mentioned before, that I would take apart books and try and figure out how people uh, would would write. I remember trying to re, re, uh, to get as many Latino books as I could because that's what I was I wanted to write initially. And I remember finding Matt de la Peña, discovering his books. We were here and just taking them apart, highlighting them, annotating everything I could on them. And then I would try and just not imitate but i just tried to apply things that i saw and i did that for 14 years and it never really got me anywhere and my writing was unorganized it had a little bit of this style and a little bit of, it was basically a frankenstein book um, and what i did with efren i didn't write it to to sell the book i just wrote it from the heart i didn't think about it i didn't it wasn't for anybody it was just for my kids uh, for them to read and what i realized was the voice that, that I wrote this book with is the same voice I started writing with a long time ago. The same voice that people told me wasn't very good, the one that I got rejected uh, with, that's, that's what's in here. So I went full circle to realize that I should have stuck with my own voice uh, from the very get-go. And I should have written something that I wanted from the heart. And I shouldn't have been trying to, when an editor says, oh, you know what, I like your style, but why don't you try this and then come back to me? Don't do that. Um, really, it's, it's your book. And at the end of the day, let's say you do sell a book and you do change it. And it's not something you're, I mean, it's not, the book's not going to be what you envisioned and you're not going to be happy with it. So write it for the person that matters the most. And that's yourself. Oh, that's good advice. Yeah. And I, and I think that, 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 that idea of writing from the heart is, is such great advice because I feel like I've definitely started projects for the wrong reasons, you know, being like, Ooh, this is a really cool concept. And like, this is really popular right now. So wouldn't this be too? And that's not like, that's not a soul book, right? Like that's not a book that, 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 like you said, Ernesto comes directly from your heart. And I think that that would be writing it for the wrong reason. And I think it will always feel a little bit thin because of that. Right. And the books that feel really true are when you're like, Ooh, there's truth in this. And there's, whether that's, you know, political truth or emotional truth or whatever it may be. And I think that when authors write from the heart, you're going to get that, that truth more than, more than anything. Um, and I think another, another piece of advice I would share that really helped me through when I was thinking about it, cause I've always been afraid of failure. You know, I think that that's something that has always scared me, but then I was thinking, you know, cause writing is a really risky endeavor. Like you're putting yourself, you're really putting yourself out there when you, when you tell people that you're trying to write or when you're trying to write a book. And so what I would always tell myself is that like, I would never fail. I would never ever be a failure if I never stopped trying. 
right? Like if you are always trying and you are always working on, you know, let's say you're first book gets rejected. All right. You could write that next book. And then that one does. And hopefully you're learning things as you move through. But if you never stop, you're always on the path. Right. And that for me was such a comfort to know that it was all up to me. Right. And how hard I was willing to try. And I was really willing to try really, really hard. And so I knew I would never fail because of that, um, which always was just such a comfort. So, but in terms of what, what I know now that I <laughs> that I wish I knew. I don't, nothing comes immediately to mind. What about you, Ernesto? I, I think the only thing I could really tell myself as far as advice is that the rejection you're going to encounter and you're going to find a lot of it. Mm -hmm. it it's kind of like, it's kind of like dating. It just takes a long time to, to, you know, meet the right person who, who cares about your book as much as you do. And um, after a while it stops hurting. And there, I always, I, I stopped taking rejection as being a no and more as to here, let me, let me, you're not ready quite there yet, but I'll let you know when you, when you are. And, and, and I'm very thankful. I mean, I, I'd like to publicly thank every, every agent and every editor who rejected me because my book wasn't ready. Uh, and I would be really sad if my, if effort about it had been published five years ago and, and it wasn't ready, that would have been horrific. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, just to, to not to get down and not to give up. And uh, it, it will happen if you really, really, if, if you really wanted to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, see, being like a 15 year old, and this is obviously my first time really experiencing writing and trying to be, I'm labeling myself as an author. I don't know a whole lot about the other end. Like once you finish your draft or you think you have your final book, where does it go? How do you get it onto the shelf? You know, editors, publishers, how do you, how did you get in contact with people? to actually make it a reality? Because that's the side that I really don't have any experience in. I, I think that's okay. First of all, you're already so far ahead of, of where, like, the mm. idea that you are working on a book right now at age 15 is amazing. Like, that is just, you are, you are leaps and bounds ahead of the process. So huge clap for that, because good for you. That is really exciting, and I'm excited to see sort of where your journey takes you. Um, and I think, honestly, right now, focusing on the book itself is the most important part. And then when you feel like you're ready, maybe to start getting friends or, or other, you know, if you have readers in your life who you really trust their feedback and everything, sharing the book. And then Google is amazing, you know, in terms of where, you know, when you're ready to start finding an agent, there's so much incredible information online that can help you you know, draft a query letter and figure out what kind of agents you want to represent your work and, and everything beyond that. So I'd say the internet is, is, was where I found pretty much all of my information. Okay. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Um, Ernesto, anything, any tips, like what did you learn going through the editing and getting rejected back and forth? Did you learn anything that you wouldn't have known? Um, you know what? I, one thing that I learned was that it'd be nice to everybody. And, and generally, people would always tell me, oh, you have to network, you have to network. And I'm like, what is this horrible word? Um, I don't want to network because I always felt like you're just try, you know, being friend nice to people because you want something from them. And it, it just it was such a horrible no notion to me. And so I'm like, no, you know what? I'm never going to network ever in my life, and I refuse to, to do it. And then I would just meet the most awesome people who'd be really supportive and, and uh, would give you advice. And, uh, and I made friends. And I didn't realize that that's, that was me networking. Uh, right now you're networking because, you know, you might, you might send me, an, I might be receiving your e an email from you in a year saying, hey, Ernesto, I don't know if you remember me, but, you know, um, we met uh, uh, online about a year ago, two years ago. And I was wondering if you could give me some advice now on where I can take my, my career from now. So you, you are doing it right now. You're meeting people. And the thing is that you have no idea who, who you're going to meet. You could be at a conference and you could be talking to, you know, one of the employees from the um, barista from the Starbucks. And this has happened. One of the baristas, I was speaking to one of them. And then uh, who was, I believe it was Arthur Levine who brought Harry Potter over to the U.S. And somehow he knew the, the person. And so, and I was just kind of like, you know, surprised. You never know. Just be nice to everybody. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you're nice to people, I, I really do believe in karma. And uh, it, it comes back. And be yeah. willing to help other people. In this industry, the more you give, the more you get. 
it's kind of like in basketball where I uh, sorry, everything's basketball to me. It's just the way it is. But yeah. I, the secret to basketball and to always getting the ball is to give the ball. So you pass the ball, you get yourself in a position to score and people will give you the ball back. All right. That's some good advice. Thank you. Uh, my next question is kind of what did publishers look for in a book? What, what did your books not have your publishers were looking for? What were some of the big criticisms that they had that, <laughs> you know? Oh, sorry. Could, could you repeat the second part of that question one more time? What, what did your book have or not have that publishers would have like that basically got you ejected? Basically is my question. You know, I think so much of it is subjective that like Ernesto mentioned earlier, it's all about finding the right fit. So I've heard agents describe it when they're, when they're, so, you know, agent is the one who's going to sell the book to the publishing house. And I've heard an agent or two describe it as they're looking for their favorite book, right? So think about how many books you have that would make it onto your favorite shelf. And for me, you know, it's, it's a mix and but it's not every book I read doesn't be instantly become my favorite. And I think that the same is true for agents that are reading work. And so your book has to become that person's favorite. And I read books that I loved and adored, but it didn't hit me in that exact spot, right? It doesn't mean anything was necessarily wrong with that book. It just meant that for me, it wasn't that exact fit. And I think the same is true for editors. You know, they're just readers too. And so of course you're going to get critiques from, from readers who don't like your style or who, who disagree with certain choices you make. But I think it's so subjective. And that's why what I love about sort of the publishing and, and well, to a certain extent, reading landscape, though, is that there's, there's a lot of variation, right? Like if everybody, if, if there was just my answer was to you, like, oh, well, it doesn't have enough action and I didn't do X, Y, or Z, all books would fit that exact sort of style. And, and that's not what's great about reading is that there's just so many different kinds of stories out there. So do you think that you should write, that I should write or any writer should create a book that is my favorite, that if yes. it's my favorite, then it's going to be someone else's? Basically? Yes. Write your favorite book. 100%. Oh. I, that is, you know, you are your first reader and, and when you love some, when you love the work, like I can tell when a writer is bored with the scene that they're writing because it comes across in the writing and it comes across in my writing when I'm bored with the scene that I'm writing. But if you love your work and you love the story you're putting together, even if it's weird and wacky and you make choices that you're like, Oh, nobody's going to like this. That's often the thing that people will point to to be like, this is so cool. So just stick, stick to your voice and stick to what you think you want to read about. That's really good. Thank you. That's uh, really good advice. Yeah, it was. Uh, um, Ernesto, what, what are some other things that, you know, did you feel the same way about uh, rejection and writing the perfect book? Um, <laughs> there was so much of it. <laughs> um, er everything that Kate said was, was right on. I agreed with everything. Um, yeah. Um, for example, Kate's book, if, if you one thing I loved about the book was that it was kind of like, and I think, yes, and, and good authors will do this. I feel like I'm reading their diaries because, and it's, it's a very intimate relationship between an uh, author and a reader because I feel like, like Kate, uh, this is the first time we're ever speaking kind of semi live in person, but yet I feel like I know Kate very well already because I, you know, reading her book. And I, I get to go inside of her mind and channel her emotions and, and, and get to see a side of her. And in society, we don't ever get to, if I meet you somewhere, we're not going to start like just, you know, exchanging our deepest secrets. But yet as authors, we do that. And when those things, secrets are authentic, you really connect with the, with the reader. And I, I really think that's really key. Uh, so if you are honest with the reader, I think it's going to shine through. And then it's a matter of finding the right people. Um, and you need to figure out what the styles, what I do with, uh, with books, um, even with that friend, I did this, the same thing too, uh, to figure out who you were going to be sending the book to. I went to the bookstore and I found books that had the same similar feel, not the, not the subject matter, just the feel. And I thought, I think people who re read this book, this book, and this book might like my book. And so I went to the back of the book to the acknowledgements. I found out who the editor was and I made a list and those are the people who we submitted to. Uh, because I thought that they, you know, it's like, I, I noticed that you were a big fan of Echo by Pan Munoz. Uh, this is something that's kind of similar in the same vein. 
and and that that helps a lot oh yeah i read that book in uh, i think the sixth or seventh grade it was really good and mm -hmm. i definitely get that kind of vibe from this story i i can see where you're coming from so just putting yourself out there writing what you know actually you feel in your in your heart is probably what's going to get make you the most successful i kind of want to close this up with uh just kind of one last just one last thing about just talking about your books individually What's your, what was your favorite part of writing each of your books? I have both of them here, and I definitely have my favorite scenes. What were your favorite parts of your books? <laughs> yeah, really good questions, by the way. Thank you. Great question. <laughs> Very deep thinking <laughs> questions. Where we, we, I feel like both Ernesto and I are like, oh, man, i got to think about that. Um, can I cheat a little bit with my answer? Sure. So I, I mean, I loved the process of writing this book and, and it's, I, I, it's really hard for me to choose a part that I love the most. Um, I'll, I'll come back to that, but I'd say my favorite part of writing it was part of the research that I did, which was that I went on the exact road trip in this book as much as possible because the origin town is, is fictional. But I, I went with my younger sister on like a eight or nine day trip where we took pretty much the exact route. So a lot of things of the details on the page are actually things that I saw and experienced myself seeing through the window signs that I thought were funny, you know, the feeling of the air, things like that were all things that I did. And it was just, we just listened to music the whole time. We stayed at motels. We went to a go, it was just great. It was such a great trip. And it felt like I was able to infuse so much of it into the book in terms of like the realistic details. Um, and for me writing the, I don't want to give anything away, but I'd say that writing the ending was very cathartic for me in terms of, you know, in terms of writing, which favorite part was. So for me, I'd say that would be my answer. But no, no spoilers. Yeah, yeah, don't want to spoil it, yeah. Uh, Ernesto, what's your favorite part of your story? Um, I'm not sure if there's a, a favorite part per se as like a scene, but there's a favorite outcome, I suppose, as far as like the process itself. I'm not sure if I'm twisting your question around or not. But I did. I, <laughs> and, oh. but, um, I guess the way I'm, I'm, okay, the opening scene, it's about the mom making breakfast. And what are they eating? Bean, leftover beans. And if you really, if I really analyze it, that's a horrific way of starting a book. I mean, they're just eating breakfast. And though he wakes up, which you're not supposed to wake up in, in a scene, right? Because that's not very exciting. He eats breakfast and that's pretty much it. And so... If I listen to all the rules and every all the the, the books that say the, the textbooks that say how you're supposed to be writing a story and how you're supposed to set them up and establish the setting and the characters, I didn't really follow any of those, and I'm probably breaking most of those rules. Uh, but what I found out was that uh, people actually were connecting to the story, and I found out that there was value in that, um, and so there was something universal and 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 just having beans uh, growing up. I, I was embarrassed that I liked beans. I thought it was like a poor person's food. And, and now I, I will shout it and I will tell people about how versatile they are, how many amazing dishes there are about it. And so I guess I developed a sense of pride that I, even I wasn't aware of during this book. And that was my favorite part. And they, were, and they would be coming, they would just like appear out of nowhere. So it was like when Max says something during the election and he makes a poster and little surprises like that that were, when I, that were just coming up, they just made me smile and they made me realize that I wasn't aware of how special some of those moments were because this book is filled with memories. Um, and so I think that was the best sort of surprise to me, just finding value in, in something as simple as beans. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, I learned a lot uh, just in these few minutes. I got a lot of good advice. I am kind of, you know, like you said earlier, it's kind of like a, my creativity is kind of like a well that needs to be filled every once in a while. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I have to go watch some Netflix to read, like even watching a screenplay or a play or any other type of entertainment can really like give me that creative energy that I need to put back into my own writing. And talking to you too definitely filled my well, it definitely, you know, rejuvenated me. And I feel like I can kind of work a little harder to write and complete something because I think completing something is the best way to write a book. Like you just have to finish it. Mm -hmm. Even if it's not good, I mm -hmm. dwell too long on the, you know, little details of, oh, this, the dialogue here is weird. This is weird. I, I, I beat myself up too much. And thank you for the, your advice genuinely, because I'm actually going to try to finish my book this time. This probably by the end of the summer, I'm hoping to finish. So 
thank you for all of the advice. Uh, thank you for allowing me to interview you, even though you know we're in quarantine and we see <laughs> each other in person. It was a good experience, and I'm really happy to have you know had this experience. And I just want to say thank you to both of you. And both of your books are really good. So <laughs> I hope you guys continue to write. I will definitely read any other novel you put out. If you do happen to put out some more in the future, I'll have them. And I have your two novels right here. They're going on my shelf. Uh, thank you. Well, thank you for the great, great questions and good luck. I'm so excited for you. And, and like you said, it's you're definitely a writer with all the things that you're thinking and worrying about because of the, those are the exact same things that I think about too. So thank you for such a great uh, Q&A, such great questions. Thanks. Yes, and I really look forward to the day that uh, someday I'm going to surprise you. I'm going to be in your, sign, in your line and I'm going to ask you to for your autograph. Definitely. So, so I'm going to try and get a copy of this video and then I'm going to, hopefully play it back to you uh when that when, it, when that wow. day comes yeah i won't no i won't forget it i won't forget it and it won't be it won't be too long hopefully I'll <laughs> so, awesome. thank you guys yeah. uh, thank, you. thank you so much mm -hmm.